in the time that we have left, let's talk a little bit about your trajectory from from this part, um, mid '90s, to where you are right now. So here you you go back, and I know we completely skipped your PhD at the University of Tennessee, um, but here you are back in Brazil um, as an assistant professor with your PhD. You're organizing conferences, you're teaching classes, you're building the mechatronics program. Tell me a little bit about that experience and then the years that came after that that led to your return to the United States. Yeah, let's see. I was an assistant professor and then in 1998 I had this new degree called Livre Docencia, so I became an associate professor. The full professors in the University of São Paulo are only allowed to go into the, uh, how to say, the process of becoming a full professor if they are associate professor with that Livre de Ciência degree. So I was kind of building my future to become eventually a full professor in the University of São Paulo. Then I wrote a book with uh, uh, person who came from South Africa, he stayed with me for one year and we decided to write a book in Portuguese. So that was, that book was about fuzzy modeling control, it's in Portuguese. And then I had connections with friends uh, here in the United States, for example, I came to Georgia Tech as a visiting faculty for three months. And I was so excited, you know, in 1999 with this experience in Georgia Tech, you know, I, I saw how nice and how many, how many opportunities we can have in the United States. So I was a little bit decided in 1999 that I was trying to change my job. So I was gonna <clears throat> even I was gonna I was going to try to either become a full professor in Brazil in another university or maybe apply to to come to the United States. I eventually applied to, to Colorado School of Mines and I was interviewed in 1999 and they gave me an offer. So I had this offer to, to come to the United States and work for Colorado School of Mines as an associate professor, professor in tenure track or I had to apply as a full professor in Brazil somewhere else. And then there are things in our life that we have to decide. There is a critical decision that you have to decide. And I decided that uh, it would be a good time yet to come to to United States because my kids were small. They were not, they're still in the middle school, elementary school, my, my daughter and my, my son. My wife was doing her degree there and then she decided to finish here in the United States. So as soon as my family supported and agreed that it would be good for everyone to move to the United States, I decided that I would accept that position here. So I resigned my position at the University of Sao Paulo, which is a very good position. You know, when I tell friends in Brazil that I resigned my career there at the University of Sao Paulo, that huge school, so famous, you know, and I could be maybe a full professor there today. They think, well, you, you made a big decision, you know, a big, big decision to go to that competitive country, United States, and to stay here in this society here where, you know, everything is run by the government, it is very different, you have 12 months salary, not 9 months salary, so there is so different there. But I'm really happy to, with my decision, I'm really happy, I think it was really nice and, and, and I'm happy with what I'm doing here. Now. I, as a father and husband, I sympathize and understand why, uh, sympathize with the importance of the family decision. But it seems to me that in addition to the family picture, there was also maybe something in Brazil that was not clicking, not resonating with Marcelo as an engineer, and maybe something that you found in okay. the United States several things, okay? We came from that transition from the military government 
Then we had a very good president. That president was actually a retired professor from my universe. He was very well respected. He was a PhD. Prof professor Fernando Henrique Cardoso was our president. He was a PhD, a very famous person in his area of uh, political science. Uh, but that time, it was not exactly his decision as a president. It was natural for the government to sell whatever they had, to work with the foreign debt, to work with the hyperinflation. So he was really successful in controlling the inflation. Our inflation from 1995 to 2000 was like 1% per year and used to be 40% per month. Okay, So it was really good. But we had an employment rate very high. The federal government, the state, cities, all the all the companies that were state owned or federal owned, they were sold, they were privatized. So we felt that it was really hard to develop technology in Brazil. We are becoming, even though with a very good economy, stable, very low inflation, it was really hard to think that we could develop something for the Brazilian technology. So I had that in my mind. What I'm doing here? I'm teaching kids to work in banks. They are not working the technology side of the bank, they're working as businessmen. What I'm doing here to develop a project that has actually no meaning for the, for the industries here. So I had that feeling that I was publishing papers in the United States, I was going to conference, but I was not doing something for my society. Then I thought, well, it's nice to have this feeling of pride, but it's not better to feel that you are actually a world citizen, that you are contributing to the world, than contributing to the Brazilian technology. So that motivated me a little bit to come to the United States, because the United States really really supports you in this sense, you know, if you are developing something good, you have a lot of opportunities here. And this is a well-established country, a well-established economy. So I was really rethinking what was my position in the Brazilian society and how I could actually contribute to, to, to the, let's say, not to the world, but to a, a broader picture by coming to the United States instead of staying in Brazil. So we also had other personal things like Sao Paulo is a crazy city. But this is, this is a personal thing. Sao Paulo has 18 million of people with, I don't know, 8 million of cars. So living in the city of Sao Paulo was really stressful for me. So combining my uh, life in the city of Sao Paulo, which is crazy, combining with this feeling that Things in the government are changing in a such way that it seems that what we are doing has no meaning for the broad picture. So let's start a new life. So that was the motivation to come here. Okay, this is very important. And I'm glad you, you, you put it in those words when you said you came to this realization that what you were doing had very little meaning for the big picture. Or at least the picture that you have come to create back in the 80s as to what it meant to develop Brazilian technology, the kind of things that you were doing 10 years before in the Foundation for Technological Development. Help me understand a little bit about this, this anxiety and this concern about the lack of meaning. Um, you, you linked it to privatization. All of a sudden, the government began to privi uh, privat uh, privatizing. Um, everything. Um, help me understand, as someone who was not there with you in that place at that time in Brazil, help me understand a little bit about this concern, this anxiety that you had. See, when you privatize your telecommunications industry, so everything in Brazil was controlled by the state. So let's give an example of telecommunications. We had a big company called Embratel, 
So Embratel run all the telecommunications in Brazil. Then we had state companies for the for the telephones. So when they sold all those companies to MCI, Telefonica de Espanha, they come to Brazil. They have a business to do. They are not concerned in having projects with foundations in schools. They want to have something that works, is fully supported, is fully deployed. So maybe it's, it's better for Telefonica, the new company in the, in the state of Sao Paulo, to have their supplies coming from uh, Asia, from somewhere outside Brazil, because it's better for them. So we felt that whatever we were trying to design in Brazil were actually a paper design at the time. No, it was a school exercise. It didn't have the same meaning that it had 10 or 12 years back. Because when you privatize and you don't have investments coming from the Brazilian companies, from the political scenario that you have, and you have to actually comply with companies, big corporations that have their business in Brazil, the scenario is really different. You, you do not work the same, the same constraints. So it's really different. So that gave me, you know, uh, that gave me the feeling that, well, if I have to do something uniform, maybe if I go to the United States, I'll do it better. And I can say very, I feel that very strongly. Today I have a lot of other uh, opportunities with my colleagues in Brazil, and I didn't have that before. I have a lot of other uh, experience that I didn't have before. I just wrote a book with a Brazilian fellow. I have some uh, cooperations with Brazilian schools. So maybe I'm doing also something here that's good for the United States, good for Colorado School of Mines, and it's also good for a few things that I can do in Brazil. To, no, I think to we, sparse room. No, 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 this is great. This is a good place uh, to conclude. Um, and I'm pretty sure we will, we will catch up here because um, from what you said, it, it, it occurs to me that the identity that you create as a Brazilian engineer was profoundly connected to the investment of the government uh, in university research and university technological development. And when that disappeared, the meaning of what it meant to be a, an engineer in Brazil sort of got lost. That's right. Completely. That's right. So in my student years, my young uh, engineer years as a young engineer or as a master of, a master student, I still had that connection with Brazilian technology and then it lost the meaning.